Andrew Stepanian. He was jailed at the same CMU unit that Daniel McGowan was held in for four months. Uh, Daniel McGowan has just been moved. We're also joined in Washington by Will Potter, freelance reporter who focuses on how the war on terrorism affects civil liberties. But I wanted to go to the clip of Daniel McGowan just before he went to jail. We interviewed him on Democracy Now! June 2007. It's it's really hard to I'm still trying to trying to get the big picture of all this. Uh, I definitely have regrets. I have regrets that I, I you know employed arson as a tactic. I, I don't think morally I, I'm I'm wrong about what I did, but I do think strategically and tactically it was, it was an unwise decision. Um, I wish that uh, I had people in my life at the time to kind of guide me back to a different path. But you know I, I was very disenchanted and very upset about what I saw. I think those feelings are legitimate. I think young kids. That have these feelings right now, and not so young kids are, um, you know, they're legitimate thoughts, and we have to, basically, we have to come up with ways of dealing with this crisis and stop ignoring it. And that was my message to the media that day after sentencing was: we have to stop pretending this is all about crime and punishment, and start dealing with like real issues like global climate change. At Daniel McGowan's sentencing hearing, June 2007, prosecutors compared him and other defendants to the Ku Klux Klan. Daniel McGowan's lawyer, Jeffrey Robinson, criticized prosecutors outside the federal courthouse in Eugene, Oregon. He stood in that courtroom as a representative of the United States government and told Judge Aiken that Daniel McGowan and his co-defendants were essentially the same as the terrorist from the Ku Klux Klan. That meant something to me personally, as an African American. And I am disappointed that my federal government would make that kind of a comparison in a case like this. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and I was born in 1956. I know something about the Ku Klux Klan and what they were about. And what they were about was murder, was killing completely different from Daniel McGowan and these defendants. Attorney for Daniel McGowan, um, Will Potter, author of Green is the New Red, an insider's account of a social movement under siege, is with us in Washington. Can you put this in context, Will? Sure. This threat, this threat of animal rights and environmental activists as the number one domestic terrorism threat, according to the FBI, has been a manufactured threat. This has been manufactured since the early 1980s, when corporations created the term eco-terrorism. And over the next several decades, they relentlessly pushed that in the press and in the courthouses and, and in Congress and congressional hearings. And so by the time Daniel McGowan was arrested, that threat had been pretty firmly established. So the government held these national press conferences announcing a major victory in the war on terrorism. And then, as we heard Marshall talking about, labeling him in the courtroom with the uh, terrorism enhancement and now putting him in the CMU. So this is really the culmination of a long-running campaign by corporations to demonize their opposition and silence dissent. And talk about what else you have found. I mean, in your book, Green is the New Red, is about the environmental movement overall. And talk about the spectrum from the ELF to the other movements that you've covered, Will. I think the most important thing to point out when we're talking about tactics in that spectrum is that the spectrum has been quite narrow. So when you look at other social movements, there are a wide range of tactics, from protests to leafleting, lobbying and, across the board, physical violence. But that physical violence hasn't been a part of the animal rights or environmental movements. So we've heard about arson, but it's arson against property and empty buildings, not to say it's not a serious crime, but that these movements have made a very concerted effort to not reach that point. And so to use the word terrorism, which to most people automatically conjures images of violence and planes flying into buildings and murder against groups that are actually trying to save life, I think really reflects these uh, disproportionate policies. Andy Stepanian, you were in the Marion, Illinois unit that Daniel McGowan was in until very recently, in a CMU. Explain what that is and, well, what his experience is like there, based on your experience when you were there. Um, Daniel McGowan and I were at the CMU Marion, um, Illinois, for about four and a half months together in 2008. 
Um, the CMU essentially is a prison within a prison. It's um, a maximum security yard, but uh, if people out there can imagine that there's a smaller unit within the prison itself, walled and contained, and done such a way that um, notes and other messages can't be passed out. Um, all communications are, are closed down. You're limited to one 15-minute phone call per week and two um, four-hour visits per month. Um, Daniel McGowan was able to see his wife during those visits, but it was behind glass. Unlike other maximum security prisons where you could actually interact with your families or hold your children, the CMU is different because you don't have any of that family contact anymore. And so it's subject to a lawsuit not only under the grounds that people that aren't of that security classification custody levels that are federally mandated are being held like they're supermax prisoners or the absolute worst of the worst. Um, it's being sued for that process as well as for the processes of these people not being able to access due process. These people that are being held at the CMU don't really have, it's kind of a, a litigative black hole where these people can't find their way out because they don't have an administrative remedies process in place set forth by the Bureau of Prisons to actually challenge their designation to that unit. And you talk about why you were in jail. I was in jail for participating in an above-ground protest campaign called the Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty Campaign, where um, the government alleges that because of our above-ground protests that were also shadowed by underground movements doing actions in solidarity with our above-ground movement, that our movement caused $300 million in damages to a private biotechnology company based out of New Jersey called Huntington Life Sciences. Um, they you weren't a part of the environmental, li the um, Earth Liberation. No, threat. I was not. However, upon my designation to the CMU, they listed me as a leader in the Animal Liberation Front, which was news to me when I arrived. I guess that they needed to kind of pad my paperwork to say that I actually was a terrorist when I arrived. And so who is held there? You were there. Daniel McGowan was there. But you represent the minority. In, in a nutshell, people that are held there are very politically charged cases, cases that are either um, um, the focus of scrutiny by the media or uh, cases that the government doesn't want to um, be dragged through the media. So the majority of the people that are held there, uh, roughly 67 percent of them, are Muslim Americans and Arab nationals. The remainder is this kind of hodgepodge of people that are environmental activists, animal rights activists, tax protesters. Tax, excuse me, tax protesters like Edward Brown, uh, anti-war tax protesters, um, and some people from um, right-wing hate groups. And talk about your interaction with the other prisoners. The majority of the prisoners there are Muslim? The majority of the prisoners there are Muslim. Um, like I said, this remainder is, is a, this hodgepodge. Compared to the prison yard where I was, I only spent six and a half months of my three-year prison sentence at the CMU. Where I was before that was a medium-high security general population prison where there were fights, you know, at least once a week. There was violence, not like what's depicted on television, but there was regular violence, and I had to be aware of it and, and prepare myself for it. Um, when I arrived at the CMU, it was peaceful. Everyone worked together. Everyone showed a great deal of solidarity with one another. There was no violence. And uh, above all else, um, I kind of had my stereotypes of, of what people that are labeled normally as terrorists um, kind of broken once I arrived. I saw people that were um, labeled as members of al-Qaeda that, at the moment I arrived there, were asking me what they can get me in the way of food. They knew I was a vegetarian. They wanted to be able to give me products that I was able to eat. They gave me shower shoes. None of this was because they wanted to indoctrinate me. It was simply because they wanted to support me when I arrived at the unit with nothing in my hands. And this was this kind of camaraderie that was at the unit. Um, everyone showed respect for one another and also respect for the guards, which was pretty much unheard of in any other unit where I was beforehand. Why are you able to speak out about the CMUs for the first time? We had you on before, Andy. You were the first person to be released from the CMU, uh, but you couldn't speak openly about it at the time. During the time when I was on the air last, I was on probation, and um, I could be violated by my probation officer um, for not committing a crime, but rather for speaking to the media about things that were sensitive to the government. Um, between that time and now, uh, there have been exposés into the CMU that have leaked who the people are that are actually there. 
Uh, my lawyer was concerned that if I mentioned the people that I actually had emotional ties with, people that I played chess with, or people that I worked out with on the yard, that I was going to be subpoenaed to a grand jury about al-Qaeda investigations simply because of what I had been through in being subjected to these individuals. I'm not Muslim myself, and, and I, I don't have any sympathy for terrorism of any sort. However, uh, my lawyer was concerned that I was going to be roped into a larger investigation, and by default, as an activist, I wouldn't want to cooperate with authorities. So um, I took the avenue of, of not talking about it until I, I got clearance to do so. Uh, the film aired last night here in New York, Marshall, If a Tree Falls. You have been applauded both by the Earth Liberation Front and by the district attorney. Right. I mean, the film really. Uh, it's not a polemical film. It's a film about an important issue, and 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 we really try to understand that issue from from all the different sides. And um, and you know, we spoke to folks who you know whose businesses were burned uh, by the Earth Liberation Front, and and from their perspective, they didn't know who these people were that were doing this, and they didn't know whether their house was going to get burned down or whether you know they 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 really did feel fear. Um, you know. People like Daniel say this is this was not terrorism. That this was uh, the Boston Tea Party, symbolic property destruction designed to to draw attention to things that people weren't paying attention to. But but it, it's not a easy issue. I mean, and and so it's been interesting both understanding this question of terrorism, but also understanding the the the, the sort of mechanics that radicalize people. Um, because uh, you know the the film is kind of designed to be a cautionary tale to activists to think clearly about the tactics that they take, kind of the ethics and the effectiveness of, of different types of tactics, and also a cautionary tale to law enforcement to, to think about the way that they respond to activism, because there are responses uh, that radicalize people and responses that bring people into democracy. I mean, the images of the police, I mean, looking like they're performing a surgical operation when they're peeling back the eyelids of—I remember playing this for years on Democracy Now! Uh, as it was happening, pulling back the eyelids and applying pepper spray to the inner lids of people who were um, peacefully on the ground. It's breathtaking. I mean, it really is. And, and you know, when you play it for a room full of people, um, there are gasps. Very quickly, the informant who first recorded Daniel McGowan, his name and who he was. So Jake Ferguson was, um, was actually the person who did the very first Earth Liberation Front arson in the United States um, and had been involved in many, many fires. And uh, when, um, when he was brought in for questioning uh, by the government, he believed that they had more information than, in fact, they did, and agreed to cooperate. And so the government flew him around the country, getting him together with his old friends who had put arson behind them years before, and getting them to talk on, on tape. He would wear a wire and get them to talk on tape about, about the actions that they'd been involved in. And so. Um, he was kind of the crack that 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 broke open this group. Will Potter, um, talk about the use of informants. It's been pervasive. And what we found in Daniel McGowan's case and in many others is that they weren't broken by um, following leads or law enforcement investigations. They put pressure on someone through the power of fear to make them turn informant and to have them testify against their friends. And that's really a theme we've seen throughout these cases, is the government manipulating this fear, using the word terrorism, using outrageous prison sentences, using new legislation to intimidate these social movements and try to get people to turn against each other. The ultimate message, Marshall, that you want people to take away from this film? Think carefully. I mean, all, all different types of people. I, I was, a, I was a, a religion major when I was in college and really wanted to figure out if there was a God and how we should live our lives. And when I was graduating, one of my friends said to me, you know, I'm still confused, but just at a higher level. And in some ways, I think a lot of these questions about what sort of activism is appropriate um, and, and how we should respond are, are, are complicated. And, and I'm just hoping that, that it prompts more conversation. Andy Stepanian, we have 10 seconds. Same question to you. I guess, in terms of his film, it follows an emotional arc of Daniel's life. He was motivated by compassion, by what he saw happening in the forest with Clear Cut. 
the same thing that draw him to help battered women at uh, Women's Law Collective is, is what motivated him. He was motivated by compassion. I could say the same thing for the men that were at the CMU. A lot of them are motivated by compassion. People like Hassan Alashi is motivated by charity. Um, Yasin Aref, these people are involved with charitable causes. Um, people should question this moniker of terrorism and, and, and support prisoners.